everybody. Good How's my microphone sounding? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, several years ago, many years ago, when my son was maybe in third or fourth grade, so seven or eight years old, he went off on a hike with his dad. We live in Southern California, and he went to one of the canyons. Uh, and then um, when they were there, they found a pond that was full of tadpoles. And so, of course, my son is delighted. He hasn't seen these critters before. He dumps out his thermos of water, scoops up some tadpoles, and brings them home. Now, when they get home to me, I'm not super excited about these little critters, but Dad assures me we're going to go um, to the aquarium shop right away and get stuff that we need to raise these uh, tadpoles into frogs. So they take off, and they're gone for a long time. Uh, and then when they come back, they have this huge aquarium and three kinds of sand and rocks and a special light, and my son is just beaming. And at first, I think that he's so happy because he just got all this cool stuff. But it turns out what he was really excited about was somebody he met, the aquarium shop guy. So it turns out that the aquarium shop guy, when he was about my son's age, went on the same hike to the same canyon, found tadpoles, figured out how to grow them into frogs, and he shared this story with my son with excitement uh, as part of the first steps to his journey uh, into his lifelong passion, which is uh, taking care of aquatic creatures. Uh, so it was interesting, uh, for about two years actually after my son met the aquarium shop guy, uh, when he was asked that ubiquitous question, what do you want to be when you grow up, he would think and scratch his little head and he would say, maybe I want to make robots or I might want to design computer games or I know I could be an aquarium shop guy. So there's going to be a lot of talk about technology and new cool stuff today and my talk as well as I'm sure through the day. Uh, but I wanted to start with this story because when I think about connected learning, at the heart of it is really relationships and the question of how we as educators can connect young people to their aquarium shop guys or how we can be aquarium shop guys for young people. Uh, those experts and enthusiasts who are passionate about their areas of interest and who want to infect young people with that passion as well as share that knowledge. So now my son is in college. He towers over me. Uh, and these days, whenever he has an interest or something that piques his curiosity, of course, the first place he goes online is online to uh, try to look around for um, information, for uh, communities of interest and so on. So the question I want to be exploring uh, in this time we have together is um, what can we do to best support young people like your students, like my son, who are growing up in a context of absolute abundance of access to information, knowledge, and social connection. And this environment is quite different from the environment in which our treasured institutions of education were founded in, where we have classrooms like this, where uh, you know, we assume that knowledge and expertise is concentrated within particular institutional walls, that young people have to have learning sequenced in a particular way, structured uh, within um, institutions that are specialized uh, to offer these kinds of learning environments. But of course, um, and as Sarah's opening uh, story illustrated, uh, the world has, around the classroom has changed quite dramatically so that young people have access to a much more abundant and free-flowing uh, source of information for them to not only learn from experts, but also be experts themselves. So um, I'll... Uh, First, uh, frame a little bit about some of the research about what kids are doing today uh, with technology, uh, and then uh, some of my own research about young people and their online affinity networks. And I'll end with some examples of uh, environments that are educator-led or educator-involved that 
are seeking to leverage some of these dynamics for connect, um, building connected learning experiences. But first, since this is you know the start of the morning, I wanted to engage you in some, I, I hope you'll indulge me in doing something a little different, just to get into the mindset of kids these days. So um, a simple uh, digital youth quiz about uh, what kids are doing uh, with technology these days. So what I'm gonna ask you to do uh, I'll show you your first question soon, but if you could sort of turn, um, and if you're sitting on your own, maybe scooch in so you can have groups of maybe three or four to do some problem solving together. And I'm assuming that all of you brought your phones, so it'll still be just a simple technology texting or thing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I think I have four questions and I'm going to ask you as a group to come up with your best guess on your answer to that question. And I'll give you just about a minute to deliberate as a group. And I also ask you to please resist the impulse to Google for the answer to the question, <laughs> even though I know that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and then I'll tell you the answer from, that's from the research. So the, um, so the first question is, actually I'm gonna show you, I'm doing a new, trying a new platform here, so let me see if I can get, this is the first question, and I think what I need to do is toggle over to the system, and um, I'm using this, uh, okay. So this is the first question, and then when you have your answer to the question, um, one per group, somebody go to www.menti.com, use this code, and then you can enter your answer. Okay, so you have one, one minute. What's your best guess to this answer, to this question? If you haven't inputted your answer, it looks like the, the, the results are coming in. Um, I see everything from uh, between, I think I saw, oh, 5% might be the lowest I've seen, and I think I've seen as high as 55%. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody got their answer in? Okay. So I think I've seen a really pretty good range here from 5 to 55%, I think, was the, the um, biggest number I saw. You ready to see the real number? This takes take a minute to... Ah, <gasps> I did not see a number this high, uh, and this uh, surprises most people. 
Uh, but I like to start with this just as a reminder that even though young people are texting and on YouTube and doing all these, engaging in all these different kinds of literacies, it's not that traditional forms of uh, reading and writing have gone away. And I like to cite some of the work by Andrea Lunsford at Stanford who has looked at uh, reading and writing practices of college students and ha how they've changed in the past 20 years. And uh, she's found that the volume of writing, uh, reading and writing has expanded dramatically, right? Because so much of communication now is being done over written form. Uh, but she's also analyzed uh, the differences in how today's students write uh, versus um, uh, an earlier generation across a wide range of university and college settings. And she found that even though um, the nature of the errors that students make has changed during that time period, 20 year time period, uh, the number of uh, errors has roughly stayed the same. So uh, it does mean that students do actually understand the difference between a text message and a college essay but the nature of their literacy practices are much more uh, social and communicative than earlier generations. Okay, ready for the next question? Okay, so this is the next question. It's about um, how many hours per day did US teens age 13 to 18 spend with media? And this does not include uh, school and homework. Okay, it looks like most people have their answers in. Uh, they seem to be ranging from about three to, I think I saw 10 as the highest. Are folks wrapping up? Okay, so I saw a pretty good range from about three to 10. Ready for the real answer? <laughs> Yeah, so I think some, some groups got pretty close to this. Now, uh, the interesting thing about this number, though, is it, um, it, they managed to pack about 11 hours a day into this nine hours because of multitasking. So this is, this is the part that really has changed, and this is a, a study done, a survey done by Common Sense Media, but uh, Kaiser Family... Uh, foundation did uh, similar surveys in the past. Uh, this number has been steadily rising just because so much of communication and entertainment is happening through media sources. Now, before we pass judgment though on teens, Common Sense did a similar stu student uh, survey with the parents of these same teens and the numbers are exactly the same. So I think it's really important to remember that yes, times are changing and it's often tempting to say, oh, it's just the kids these days, but actually it's changing for all of us. And so a lot of our reflections about young peoples and technology, uh, I think needs to be situated within that context. Okay, let's move on to games. So what percentage of Americans do you think play games every day?
Okay. We're seeing pretty high percentages there. I saw 130%, but uh, 80, 90% even of daily game players. Okay, so here, this comes from the Entertainment Software Association, but wait for it. Nope. No, it doesn't want to go back to this one. Okay, this is going to work. Yes. <laughs> So remember, this is daily, daily, daily gaming. Now, if you ask about just do you play games, obviously that number is much higher. Uh, gaming um, really is the dominant entertainment medium of our time. Uh, and I think that's something that we are really still coming to terms with. It uh, outpaced the movie industry in terms of market size and revenue, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, and it has crossed gender lines too. So uh, virtually all teenagers play games and you know the gender split has kind of hovered at that upper 45, 48% for women uh, for some time. So again, this is one of the things that has changed. Interactive uh, formats in media have become a dominant expectation. Okay. Last question about friendships. So how many teens aged 13 to 17, this is a 2015 survey, have made new friends who they didn't first know in real life online? Percentage, a percentage, yeah, <laughs> not a raw number. Okay, this one's an interesting one. I feel like there's been a pretty wide range between 10 up to, I saw even 100%, so it's not a consensus on this one. Sometimes it wants to see it, sometimes it doesn't. Just helps build the suspense. I'm doing it on purpose. Ah, that I did not do on purpose. Okay. There we go, okay, there we go. Yeah, so I, this one is really interesting. I find that when I ask people what their um, assumption is about this, it tends, people tend to think it's higher than what uh, youth actually report. Uh, when we did our research, the Hangout book that Sarah mentioned, which was the field work for that book was, is now about 12 years old. Uh, young people actually thought it was, even, even at that time, grown-ups were very worried about young people meeting strangers on the internet. Uh, and when we talked to young people, they thought it, it was still the norm that it was kind of creepy to meet people you didn't know in real life online. But I thought this survey was very interesting because for the first time, we're seeing 
we're seeing a tip where the majority of young people do actually meet people in, uh, online who they didn't know first in real life because un until then, uh, it was really the norm that the online networks were mirroring the offline networks and you had to be kind of nerdy or different to be doing something um, that was counter to that. But now the majority of kids say they do actually meet new friends online. And a, a fairly significant proportion of those friends, they might actually um, then translate into a real life friendship. Uh, for boys, it's overwhelmingly around gaming, and for girls, it tends to be around social media. So, thank you all for participating in the Digital Youth Quiz. Everybody's a winner. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> um, oh, here's just the, yeah, the boys versus girls breakdown on social media. So, I think the question in front of us is, what happens when these very connected young people walk into rooms like this, into our um, uh, institutions of education. Uh, sometimes uh, they do things we approve of, like, um, like uh, do wiki uh, note taking. And sometimes they do things like go to ratemyprofessors.com to figure out who's a soft grader before they take their class. Uh, they might go to one of the ready-made essay download sites, which are everywhere on the internet if you happen to be assigning the same essay every year. Uh, watch out. Uh, or my favorite, uh, services that will go online and that you can go online and get somebody to take your online class for you and they guarantee they will get you an A. So um, the, the, the problem is that uh, these new technologies enable such a degree of connection and peer-to-peer communi -peer communication at the student layer uh, that as educators, we really can't be in the business of just playing whack-a-mole all the time and trying to not get them to be exchanging knowledge and information. And I think it really challenges us to say, look, what does it mean then to set up learning experiences that aren't about just rinse and repeating the same um, sort of uh, assignments, it's not just about filling in the blanks, that there is a spirit of genuine inquiry, problem solving um, that is happening that uh, is uh, not something that is subject to these kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, workarounds that young people now have access to. Now, we know that uh, young people start uh, schooling, fairly engaged, so this is a survey of student engagement. Uh, majority very engaged in elementary school, uh, but by high school their engagement in schooling starts dropping off. Uh, and by the time they enter our institutions of higher education, most of them uh, report uh, as being disengaged. Uh, one of my colleagues, actually our Dean of Education at UC Irvine, uh, has done some research with Josip Orozka about um, uh, learning in the college years, and he's found some pretty depressing results. Uh, he, they did uh, surveys and uh, tests of students in their, at the beginning and end of their first two years of college, and they were looking at uh, learning, uh, not subject-specific learning, but sort of more foundational uh, reading, writing, thinking skills, competency, and found that almost half the students across a wide range of institutions that they uh, looked at demonstrated very little learning in their first two years of college, learning on those measures in their first two years of college. Uh, so I think we're encountering the situation where, you know, of course kids have always complained about school and have been bored in class and that we've had disengaged young people, but What's happening today is that the world outside of the classroom has changed so dramatically that that um, tension and culture clash between the more informal, student, um, kid-driven, interest-driven learning and what's happening in the classroom, that culture clash is just getting more and more acute because of today's um, ecosystem. And different young people experience uh, this gap in different ways. Uh, I think a lot of people are, um, you probably are all aware of equity gaps within formal education, whether it's in K-12 or college attendance, college completion, all of those things. I think what gets less talked about is the equity gap in access to informal education and enrichment activities. 
Uh, so this is uh, research on looking since between the 70s and 2006 in how families invest in out-of-school enrichment activities for young people, uh, comparing the bottom income quintile and the top income quintile. And you'll see that for poorer kids and families, it stayed at about $1,000 a year. Uh, and for wealthier families, those investments have nearly tripled uh, from $3,000 to almost $9,000 a year. Uh, and what this really shows is that in today's environment where uh, to get into a good school and to be successful and stand out in high school, all those things, you know, it's not enough just to be you know, getting good grades and pleasing your teachers, but you also have to have saved the world a couple times and be a star athlete and, you know, all of this curation that's going on in this arms race for achievement, um, plus the fact that wealthier families are realizing that in today's environment, and poor families realize it too, they just don't have the same resources, that a lot of what young people are getting in terms of you know, developing an identity as somebody who has something to contribute to that world, that experience of connecting to friends and, you know, big brothers and big sisters and mentors who share an interest, whether it's in the arts or athletics or coding or whatever it is, um, that experience of performing in public, contributing through athletics or arts or whatever their interest and getting genuine feedback, uh, you know, that firm handshake, learning how to look a grown up in the eye, finding a place where you belong, those are experiences that are foundational to young people finding who they are, finding their place in the world, and developing relationships that protect and lift them up as they move through those, these difficult transitions to adulthood. And so wealthy families are going outside of the school system to provide those opportunities to their young people. Um, this is happening in a context where, especially for lower uh, income, uh, for schools and districts serving lower income students, the number of extracurriculars being offered at the school level is declining. So you put those two graphs together and then you can see that the equity gap in terms of these more informal, interest-driven learning opportunities is really, really dramatic. Now we hope that today's technology can make a difference in those equity gaps. So there's all this free and open online learning, YouTube videos, Khan Academy, uh, all this great stuff on the internet uh, that we hope uh, will help uh, close some of these equity gaps. Uh, and you know, just looking at MOOCs, the number of these kinds of uh, free and open online learning um, experiences has just exploded. But I want to call attention to some of the equity issues uh, in this uh, uh, space as well. So uh, two of, uh, of my colleagues, Hansen and Reich, did a study of um, HarvardX and MITx, uh, two large MOOC classrooms by elite universities, and they compared the zip codes of those folks taking those classes with the general population in the US and you'll see the lighter pink line are the um, Harvard X and MIT X participants. So in terms of neighborhood median income and neighborhood educational attainment, you'll see there's a pretty wide gap with the general population. And this kind of finding has been replicated in other studies as well, which have found that the people who take open online courses by fancy, um, offered by fancy universities are overwhelmingly people who already have degrees in higher education. Now, that doesn't mean that these resources don't help everyone, but they help more privileged people at a greater rate than less privileged groups. So they, again, Hansen and Reich describe this as the difference between a closing gaps and rising tide scenario. We're currently, I would say, with new online learning technologies in a rising tide scenario where everybody is benefiting, um, but wealthier and more tech savvy groups are benefiting higher, so the actual gaps are widening. What would it take to move to a closing gap scenario? And I think that's where we have to be very intentional, not just about putting stuff out there, but thinking about who it's designed for, what institutions 
are um, embracing and bringing these technologies to young people who may not be you know, finding it on their own or may not be in home environments that have ubiquitous access to streaming video and these other things that are often required to participate in these kinds of um, learning environments. Okay, so I want to do a quick uh, take the temperature of the room. Uh, so I'm hoping you can show me with either thumbs up, side, or down. How optimistic or pessimistic do you feel about how um, your institution, your university, is grappling with some of these changes in technology and learning where thumbs up is we're doing a great job of innovating and trying new things um, and embracing some of the opportunities of new technology sideways is uh, maybe a little bit of each and thumbs down is we still have a long way to go. Where would you put yourself? Okay, a couple thumbs down, but it's a pretty diverse mix of opinions. Okay, now I want to ask the same question of how do you feel about kids these days? Are they, like, are these new technologies helping make them smarter, more engaged, and better in most ways? Um, thumbs down is distracted, narcissistic, and not so good. <laughs> I think you're more optimistic about young people than about your university. <laughs> but there was a pretty good mix there, too. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to transition now to uh, make it a little bit more concrete, some of these bigger trends. Uh, the work I do is really more in-depth case study, uh, youth-centered work, ethnographic work. I'm an anthropologist by training, so mostly I hang out with kids on the internet and play video games with them and try to understand uh, what the digital world looks like from their point of view. Um, and uh, Sarah mentioned the, the two books that are in this vein. Um, so I think that I, I love talking to educators and parents about these issues. Um, I think that often, uh, especially for educators and policymakers or uh, technology designers, we're putting our institutions and organizations at the center of our concern, which makes a lot of sense. But, um, you know, that's where I think it is important to, at times, think of, um, shift the lens to think from a learner's point of view, a learner who's situated within a complex web of institutions that they're trying to navigate. And our university or our classroom is just one of these many sites of learning that they're navigating in their everyday lives. So I want to start with an interest that might be a little bit challenging for all of you. So I study um, a lot of different youth interests, and the one that seems to get the most eye rolls from educators is uh, tween girls' love of boy bands. So let's just start there. Um, so this is obviously um, you know, a younger age group than you're dealing with, but I think in, instructive in how young people in that period of time, like in the you know, that 12 to 14 year old range when young people are starting to embrace these identities that are centered around popular culture and passions and reaching out to others on the internet to connect with uh, like-minded peers. So we did a study, uh, one of our graduate students, Ksenia Kromkova, of One Direction fans who were on the publishing site Wattpad, which is a mobile friendly uh, sort of digital writing site that has really taken over most of the fan fiction community at this point. Uh, and it was very interesting uh, seeing what she uh, came up with because the young people narrated their connection to each other through this um, fan fiction writing in ways that were very um, strong and profound. And uh, even though at the time, you know, obviously this research was a few years old and One Direction was like a huge phenomenon. And there were, like in any, you know, middle school or high school, there were tons of girls, mostly girls, there were boy fans too, but uh, who were really into One Direction. But it was so stigmatized within the school and the peer group that they felt they had to go online to really be able to get their fangirl out and really connect with other girls in a way. And you know, they talk about being a directioner has made me so, so, so many like-minded friends, national and international. This one 
girl, 14, it was so sweet. I made my first ever true friend around two months ago. I was looking for someone to play the lead on my next story and she offered. From then on, we started to talk more and more. She's four years older than me. She's really nice. So where else do kids these days have the opportunity to interact in mixed age communities where they're connecting with older peers around something that they really care about? When that connection happens, it's really profound because there's so few contexts in the way that we've segregated young people by age, the way that we limit their mobility through different spaces uh, for them to find these kinds of connections. Uh, and then the other, like when we, we, we've deliberately selected these case studies for environments that all show strong forms of peer connection and affinity-based networking, but also have ties to competencies and literacies that could serve young people well in school. So Wattpad, obviously, it's about writing and reading. So we were curious about that, and we found that for a lot of young people, uh, it was the first time they were writing because of an interest, right? So they had been writing for school, but this felt very different for, for them. Um, and have, looking at the transcripts of, you know, Ksenia interviewing these kids, it was very interesting because you'll see through the course of the interview that they start reflecting on their own identities as readers and writers. So I write silly stories. When I think of a writer, I imagine a serious guy or a girl sitting on the desk, typing on a typewriter, drinking coffee to stay awake through the night. <laughs> but then he laughs and says, well, in a way, maybe I am a writer. Uh, but uh, the thing that was very consistent, though, even though they might be exploring these identities as writers, is that they don't let their teachers at school know that they're engaged in this activity. So, I mean, the school doesn't encourage it. They don't really know that 80% of the girls in our grade have Wattpad. Ah, so you don't even tell your teachers. No, no, it's like a private thing between students and friends. And so this is the part to me that seems like a real missed opportunity. That we've so stigmatized what young people are doing online, assume that it's a waste of time, especially something as frivolous as boy band fandom, that young people don't feel like they have the permission or openness to be able to explore those kinds of interests in the context of a school setting. I mean, there are girls who are reading hundreds of pages of fan fiction, writing hundreds of pages of fan fiction, and they tell us, I'm not a reader, I'm not a writer, because that, those words have become so strongly associated with what happens in school. Okay, let me walk through this in the case of a specific young person. She was 14 uh, at the time we, uh, Ksenia interviewed her, and she was both a Potterhead and a Directioner. Uh, she, uh, when she got her first mobile phone, she started accessing a wide range of fan fiction through Wattpad, and uh, she got the courage to start publishing her, her own writing on Wattpad, uh, and then she started getting feedback. Um, you know, very much like what Sarah was describing with the young man and her, and his YouTube videos, and started getting a following. Uh, and uh, so her trajectory started, like in her case, it was a popular culture interest. She wasn't a writer before that, but then through Wattpad, she found a set of, a community uh, with a set of interests that, that were, were similar but also encouraged a new practice, a practice that was new for her, which was around writing, reading and writing. And then the interesting thing about uh, uh, her case is that her mother was actually really supportive and she was open with her mother about uh, you know, what she was doing on Wattpad. And eventually, she, um, her mother supported her to apply to uh, a special high school that had a stronger emphasis on writing. Uh, and she was a fairly shy kid, and it was a big step for her to have the courage to go to a different school. But um, she really credits that development of both the interest in writing, but also the confidence to do something like that to her participation with the Wattpad community. So the moral of the story is not that the internet creates connected learners like her, but that it actually doesn't. Uh, 
unless there are positive support, supporting relationships that are making that happen. In fact, uh, when, you know, we've interviewed hundreds of young people, and we find that most young people are really struggling to connect uh, their interests, their identities to what's relevant in school um, and other, and career and other settings. So usually what we see is that there's some sort of interest that young people are exploring in home. They're often, you know, have an online environment that might support that interest. There may be some uh, organizations in the community that are arts organizations or technology organizations that support it, but very little connections to school for most kids. Uh, and part of the problem, I think, is that when we think about education, um, we think of it as a pipeline where our goal as educators is we get them in elementary or pre-K, and then if we can keep just like pushing them up to the next step in the pipeline, uh, college readiness, get them into college, and then you know they'll have a launching pad for an amazing career. Uh, but when you talk to young people who have been successful, especially in some of these more high-tech or creative type careers, their support network actually looks a little bit more like this, where the formal pathway is incredibly important, but there's an incredible network of uh, supports in the family and the community through those enrichment activities that families are investing in uh, that are um, that kind of protective web that keeps them both engaged in school but also captures them and protects them when they start going off the rails or if they can't find a point of connection within the school environment. Um, so as educators, I think the, um, the question is what can we do to more intentionally help support the connections between these different environments? And you know, we've all been trained to think of ourselves as content experts and sharers of information to young people. I think more and more in a networked environment, we have to consider our role not only to be uh, experts uh, and instructors, but also to be brokers and connectors across different environments. And to think, for those of you who are, who are on the administration and policy side, to think of what po kinds of policies might allow that to happen a little bit more seamlessly so that we can really understand and be open to what young people may be doing in these more informal environments and also consider connecting them to mentors, specialized um, organizations, even if our own organizations can't meet those learning needs. Um, so again, we come back to this question. Um, you know, it seems like a very complicated issue. How do you support a connected learning environment that's so complex, multi-institutional, where learning is happening everywhere? But at the heart of the matter, we're really just back to the aquarium shop guy. What do we do to help young people find the mentors who they feel a genuine connection to, whether it's through you know, an interest, whether it's through other kinds of identity, um, you know, background, ethnicity, culture, all these things matter in terms of young people finding uh, connection um, and inspiration. Uh, so I want to ask if you all could do just a quick pair and share. So turn to your neighbor, or if you're three people, that's fine. But I want you to reflect for just a moment about your childhood, or it can be in your professional life as well, of some person in your life who really, uh, you really uh, felt a connection to, and who helped uh, introduce you to something new, push you further in something that you were already interested in, or supported you through a learning challenge. If you could just share uh, one person in your life, or it can be an author, or you know, somebody you, it doesn't have to be somebody you knew in person too. So let's just take one minute, 30 seconds each. So I'm curious if with, we could do a quick show of hands. How many people named a teacher? Okay, teachers usually win. That's a good number. Uh, how many of you named a family member? Okay, that's a good number. How about a uh, coach, um, teacher from an informal environment? Okay, fair number. Uh, how about a friend 
her colleague, um, faith leader, a couple. Anybody, any category I missed? Employer. Oh, employer, that's, sorry, what was? Professor. Professor, okay. Did, yeah, I don't know if teacher and professor was, yeah. Author, Author great. Boss. Sorry, what? A boss. A boss? Professional development, is that what you said? Or somebody said. Oh, neighbor, okay. So, it, yeah, this, this range of uh, answers to this question really um, attests to the fact that you can find learning heroes in all areas of your life, but then there's definitely a critical mass of people who find their learning heroes within our educational institutions. So those of us who are tasked professionally to play that role are incredibly important. Uh, but there's also, I would say, about half of the folks named somebody who was in an environment other than a formal teaching profession. So the importance of these connections, those, these learning hero connections, is borne out in the research. I'm not just saying it. So this was a big study that uh, Purdue and Gallup collaborated on. I think they interviewed 20,000 uh, college graduates across a really wide range of institutions, big schools, little schools, elite schools, less selective schools. And they found that there were two things that really mattered for life thriving. And by that, they meant more than just like having a good job. It was about health and connection to community and all kinds of things. Uh, one thing that mattered was projects that lasted more than a single uh, term. So some kind of project, it could be classroom, it could be extracurricular, but it was an indicator that they were engaged in something that transcended, that was connected, right? That transcended a particular class. Uh, the other thing that mattered is the learning hero. If there was a, a, a professor who they really connected with, that had a huge effect size that lasted till well after they left college. Uh, another study by one of my colleagues in the Connected Re Learning Research Network did a meta-analysis of uh, youth mentorship programs. So these are like big brother, big sister, formal mentorship programs. And they tend, most of them tend not to match based on affinity, right? So there's sort of this implicit idea that you match a privileged kid with a less privileged kid and somehow that's going to rub off or there's some model in there um, <laughs> rather than saying, you know, looking at shared interest and identity, but when, uh, they do match on identity, the effect size is better. Not surprising, right? But a lot of, you know, you don't think about this all the time. Uh, when, you know, and that's formal mentorship, but the vast majority of our mentors come from informal settings, right? Family or, you know, activities in the community and so on. And only a small percentage, that top 4%, um, have, are part of a formal mentorship program. And again, just to return to some of the issues around equity, uh, you know, affluent youth have a wider range of informal mentors across, uh, I think, all of these categories, like family, religious, or youth group leader, coach, counselor, teacher. Um, and then uh, more educated parents have broader social networks. So these are asking, um, you know, do you know a professor, or a congressman, things like that. Again, not surprising, but really important to remember that uh, a lot of the kind of learning that we've been looking at for connected learning uh, is based on these kinds of learn, you know, being able to find your learning heroes and relationships, and those opportunities aren't equitably distributed. Uh, so, Justin, I know I'm running a little bit, I'm running close to my, the end of my time. But I wanted to, before I end, give a few examples of environments uh, that have been designed with principles of connected learning uh, in mind. Uh, and uh, connected learning is not only a way of describing a kind of learning where, uh, you know, in a nutshell, it's when kids are doing something they care about, that they feel interest and affinity with, in the context of caring relationships with peers and mentors who share that interest and identity. And the important thing is it's tied to opportunities of finding their place in the world. So it's not enough for a kid to just be geeking out on something they find cool, but connected learning is about 
connecting that learning to academics, to civic engagement, or career relevant opportunity. And we've designed, or we're, this is very much a work in progress, so I always welcome feedback, but there are, after observing a lot of these environments and practice, we found those certain characteristics of environments that embody connected learning. Uh, one is sponsoring youth interests, um, shared practices and shared purpose, and then connections across setting. And I'll walk through a couple examples to show how that manifests in practice. Uh, I also like to stress the fact that we are not saying that all learning has to be connected learning all the time. Sometimes kids need to learn things they're not interested in. And sometimes they need to just be able to muck around with their friends and it not being about like a line in the resume or getting good grades. So kids need space to just be kids and be interested and have friends. Uh, but we do believe that every young person deserves to have the opportunity to experience connected learning. Because unlike other forms of learning, there's so much bang for the buck. It's not just about acquiring skills and knowledge. It's about finding your place in the world. It's about finding who you are. It's about finding your people. It's about deep senses of belonging and purpose that drive the learning and drive kids' uh, development that's social, emotional, cultural, as well as about being what's in the head. And so our goal is really to say, it's like kids are going to be learning all kinds of things in all kinds of settings, but can we create environments that you know, um, facilitate their finding their thing at, this, at the sweet spot? So I'll start with just a couple of examples in higher ed that are, you know, when people see the model, it seems very difficult and complex. Uh, but I think it's an import, important to remember that Nobody on their own can design a fully connected environment. The whole model is based on the fact that we're located within an ecosystem of influences that young people have. And what may seem like nothing to you could be life-changing to a young person if it's located within the sweet spot. So an example of just, you know, what are the kinds of openings you create? So this is an example from a professor um, at UNCSA who he was a writing teacher, or he is a writing teacher, and uh, what he did was just uh, start um, having their ki his kids blog instead of writing traditional essays and blog about something they care about in their everyday life. So it's pretty simple, and he found it was completely transformative. But this is an example of a simple uh, instantiation of how you can sponsor youth interests. Um, that you create a space within our powerful institutions for young people to feel safe um, in sharing who they are and sharing their interests. It's kind of like I think back to elementary school, when do we do that? It's like show and tell might be the one time. But there are openings and um, opportunities you can create for young people like that. Um, another one which is slightly more involved, or actually quite a bit more involved, is um, FemTechNet, which uh, was a, is a network of feminist scholars of technology who are, were, are themselves a connected affinity group, and they decided that they would start teaching together online, so they built like a shared bank of curricular resources, and they would synchronize their classes so that they could beam into each other's classes, and um, their students could connect with one another across institutions uh, through activities like wiki storming. So um, you probably know that Wikipedia has really poor representation of um, women and minority um, issues and uh, um, individuals. So they would um, go on to wiki as a class and correct or add new wiki entries. Um, so that's an example of you know just a way that you can you know, it's grounded in a shared interest, but it's embodying the principles of shared purpose. I think when you're doing justice-oriented work, that purpose can be very powerful, um, and that is also driving that connections across settings so that they're building capacity both at the faculty and student le le level to connect both across academic institutions but also into real-world institutions like Wikipedia. Um, so a couple examples that are a bit more um, that, that are uh, a bit more orchestrated across multiple institutions. So Connected Camps is a um, 
a nonprofit I founded together with Katie Salen, who's a game designer, and Tara Brown, who was active in the maker uh, movement. And our model is that we uh, hire high school and college uh, um, gaming nerds to teach younger kids on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, it, and we've been primarily doing it within the game of Minecraft. We also do Roblox and Scratch, other sort of um, popular youth, uh, uh, popular games for the eight to 13 year old set. Uh, so again, the principle, we start with where kids uh, are. We started with the most popular game of all time and we captured the interest there, but then uh, we design a different set of shared practices in the forms of, of summer camps and after school clubs that are facilitated by young people who are fellow nerds in the specialty, um, but structuring environments um, that have a different kind of shared purpose from the straightforward gameplay that most kids are doing. So we would organize epic builds or they learn how to code within Minecraft. So pushing kids beyond what they would just be doing with their same age peer group. Uh, and, you know, again, because uh, Minecraft is such, uh, like the ecosystem around Minecraft is amazing, whether it's YouTube or, um, you know, all these other, you know, Minecraft wikis, that whatever their kid, the kids are doing, a lot of them start publishing their own Let's Play videos or um, experimenting with other mods. And so what, whatever we're doing within our community is also connected to this broader Minecraft community. Uh, another gaming example, we've been collaborating, uh, Connected Camps, our nonprofit, does the coaching for the National North American Scholastic Esports Federation. That's a mouthful. Uh, but esports has obviously become a huge thing, uh, and uh, we're trying to figure out how to um, build connections to school that's productive. Uh, so again, sponsorship of youth interests, you know, competitive video gaming is the thing these days for young people. Uh, but then shared practices, you know, obviously kids are playing competitively at home, but uh, relatively few high schools know how to run their own esports uh, clubs and teams. So we provide the training uh, infrastructure for the league and for um, what it takes to be a GM and other, um, and then we provide the coaching virtually because a lot of high schools don't have the expertise to coach. Uh, and, you know, games are great because tournaments drive shared purpose, it's built into a lot of esports. Uh, and then we also support uh, the connections to a in-school curriculum around um, in the, uh, on entrepreneurship related to esports, um, as well as do our best to connect with the parents so that they understand the positive value that esports can have in kids' lives and how to structure gaming engagement in a positive way for their young people. And the last example uh, is in a library space, uh, the UMedia, it's a network of digital maker spaces and museums and libraries across the country. The very first one was founded 10 years ago in the main Chicago downtown library. Uh, and it was um, designed by uh, Nicole Pinkard's team in the Digital Youth Network um, in partnership with Chicago Public Library and designers at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and Nicole, she, when she started the space, she very intentionally staffed it with teaching artists who embodied the identity and the interests and culture of the youth in Chicago that she was trying to serve. So they did music and spoken word and graphic arts and things that they knew would attract the young people in the area. Uh, and then around that, they offered you know, resources like a sound studio and good computers and things, but they also had shared practices, like the spoken word uh, group would have a weekly open mic session. Uh, the um, music kids, they produced a record label, so it wasn't just about showing up at the space, but doing epic things together. Uh, and, um, you know, those kinds of shared practices laddered up to a sense of purpose that you were building something that was giving back to the community. The gamers, they played games there. Like it was the first time they could come to the library and play Xbox and bring food, but they also produced a podcast uh, for their game reviews that, were, that they put out on the web. Um, and even though it was a physical space, uh, we think of it as a connected learning environment because of that kind of sharing on the open internet 
and also the fact that young people were encouraged to connect to other opportunities around the city through spoken word competitions, through uh, fashion shows, and other things that made their work visible to a broader community. Um, so I want to end, we'll have some discussion hopefully, but I wanted to end with an ask to all of you. Uh, so um, it's often um, overwhelming to think about how you can adapt to uh, take advantage of these new kinds of network learning opportunities, but I think it's also very simple in a way because all of us are connecting and contributing and supporting each other in so many different ways in our everyday lives. Uh, but one thing that I found um, talking to a lot of people around the country is that we often don't realize the impact that we're having in the things we do every day. And so I have just one ask. So you, uh, a few minutes ago, you talked about somebody who had an impact on your own learning. I wanna ask you, does that person know the impact they had on you? Um, if you could, before the end of the day today or tonight after you um, go home, make sure that they, you let them know. Pick up the phone, send a tweet, um, send them a text or an email or whatever it is, and just make sure your learning hero knows the impact they have on your lives. I talked to so many young people who described that one conversation they had with the teacher and professor, um, that one you know, activity that really changed them. But most times, the person who had that influence don't act, doesn't actually know that happened. So have faith that you're, having, you're making a difference in connected learning, even if you don't hear that every day. OK, so we have a lot of resources. We run an annual conference. There's a site that has a lot of stories and case studies of connected learning. So um, I hope you'll consider joining us uh, in our online community or in one of our events if this was of interest to you. Thank you. All right, friends. So if you're following along in your agenda, we have until about 10.40 for questions and and dialogue with Dr. Ito about her work and about the keynote and the intersections that you see in your work and the things that are working in your spaces. We hear you great. Yeah. Do you? Okay, good. Uh, I'm thinking about accessibility. So, um, and this is a, it's a vulnerable question in a room full of educators. It might be a little naive, but I'm curious to hear you think about this question. Um, we're in an area where schools are really segregated. You talked already about sort of achievement gaps. And there are connected learning environments that come sort of more ready-made in private schools that have more money and that can exclude people who have less money and people of color and um, and uh, I have a kid in pre-K, I wasn't as aware of the level of segregation until I saw that happening. And so I wonder what encouragement you have for those of us who are wanting to support the public schools and to help um, you know, support people who are struggling, I think, with standardized testing and the other things that sort of can squelch these connections and creativity uh, in an environment of great segregation and challenges there. I wonder what words of encouragement you have for how we can help to fill these more connected spaces given that context. Yeah, no, thank you for raising that. I mean, I, I feel like issues of equity and connected learning are so, um, they're, they're, they're difficult and critically important. And you know, as somebody who really focuses more on the social, cultural, and the emotional dimensions of learning, I find that a lot of the policy debate around equity, it doesn't take into account those real sort of human aspects of how kids feel included or excluded. So the thing that's tragic to me is that often there are these well-meaning interventions that are like, giving laptops to everybody or, you know, opening up coding classes in low-income schools, for example. Uh, but they don't, 
if you don't address issues of identity and belonging, it doesn't work. And that's why we find that, you know, even like there's this big push to get black and brown kids into coding and then some of them even make it through high school against the odds and go to major in computer science. And then they just, like somewhere along the way we lose them because we haven't dealt with the human connection, making sure that there are, um, they have, they're not the exception all the time and they're not, you know, they're not experiencing this cultural push out and it's about, it's not, they're not the problem. Our institutions are the problem. And so the way that I like to think about it is for every ounce of intervention we do on the poor and disadvantaged kids, we have to do two ounces of intervention on our institutions to fix them around these issues of inclusion. So a lot of times the way these um, things go is like, okay, let's create a makerspace in a poor community or like give more programming to um, poor kids. But, you know, I think we have to take a hard look at our actual practices within our elite institutions too. Um, and what that looks like um, is often counterintuitive when you think of a connected learning experience. Um, I know this is a long answer, but I'll give one example because what I described is very um, conceptual. So Google used to sponsor, and I was really sad that they stopped sponsoring it, a program called Ignite CS, which um, they incentivized uh, undergraduates majoring in computer science to teach computer science to kids in the community. And it sounds like that's an intervention for the kids in the community, but it was actually an intervention for the undergrads for, to promote undergrad retention because it was a very smart move because it was building on what we call an asset-based approach which recognized that um, kids of color and women who were majoring in computer science they were both strongly motivated to give back because that's a set of values that they hold really dear, but they also really benefited from having an experience of being the best in the world at this thing they were asked to do in computer science. And they also had a structure where they met other marginalized kids within the um, computer science world so they had a protective social network. You walk into a class and you know somebody who looks like you. They started doing homework together and supporting each other. Um, and then the effect size in terms of their sense of alienation from CS really changed. The bigger, biggest effects were for the kids that were most marginalized from the target field. So that's an example of an intervention that is based on a connected approach versus like a let's throw more remedial skills and content at kids um, that leverages their actual identity and interests and assets. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so um, it, it, I love this conversation. When I did my uh, PhD program, I remember it was a sociology professor we talked about the idea of doing a dissertation around community. And I asked the question about online communities because we were, they were growing and growing. He said, well, that really, community as it's defined in sociology can include like electronic communities. I said, are you sure? And now, I, I, you know, fast forward, I mean, that's really, it's been a long time since I've been <laughs> But, you know, but it was kind of just coming up the idea of that. But now, you know, you see it. But what's interesting to me now, I guess, the, and the question I have, we talked a lot about the positives and the great um, support that the communities, these online communities can create. My question is, community also, when we study it sociologically, has a dark side. How do we teach and address developmentally the dark side of those things? Because, I mean, the, make, the reality is we live in, we're in the United States, which is capitalist, kind of, you know, financially driven. So all of these rabbit hole students and kids go down there's usually a capital component to it. There's a financial component where somebody's trying to get something. In education, we, even in education, we fall into that trap too. So I guess that's the question I'd love to hear some discussion on is how do we balance this wonderful, amazing growth of technology with kind of the darker hum side of you know, humanity, really, that comes into play. It's built a little along the equity piece, but even more so, you have these minds that are they can go down a rabbit hole, a good one, with the right guidance, or they can go down a really bad rabbit hole and never come back. 
and that you know you see that in counseling and therapy too so i just i'm just yeah. throwing that out there as a conversation because i feel like we've gone one path without talking about the other side and, and that balance so. yeah no thank you for that uh yeah i think it's uh yeah Obviously, today in today's day and age, we do not believe the internet is all rainbows and unicorns. Uh, you know, and that understanding has evolved a lot in the you know 15 years that I've been studying kids' internet culture. Uh, and we are definitely in darker times. And I think, in fact, a lot of the more open online communities that I used to study have sort of closed their doors a little bit. And in our current work with young people, we find, especially for uh, young people who are likely to experience harassment because of their identities or interests, they're interacting in much more private kinds of groups. So especially uh, women of color, um, you know, LGBTQ teens in the early internet, like the internet was a haven for them to find like-minded uh, peers, but they're increasingly experiencing more harassment. So there's definitely dynamics that are changing, and the nature of how young people are navigating that is changing a lot, and I think it's really important that we look at that. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who study the darker side of the internet. You know, there's definitely just as many kind of negative interests, forms of radicalization, uh, and so on. It's not my focus. Um, so that's something just to clarify methodologically. Like I think it, it takes an ecosystem of approaches, right? We need people who are studying the kind of negative and adversarial kinds of stuff that's happening out there. But I also believe that it's really important that we don't end at critique and we actually have to participate in making sure that young people find the positive dimensions. So what I do object to is grown-ups just saying, oh, it's just, you know, terrible out there, we should not let kids participate, because it's not a viable alternative. Like asking people to turn off their devices and so on, Hap you know, fine, device-free dinner, fine, but like you can't, you can't l realistically not participate. And then the question is, um, what is, is our participation as adults and educators has to be more than lids down. It has to be engaged with guiding people to the po young people to the positive engagements and actually mentoring them through these very difficult choices they're making. And so my personal niche within this broader niche of research is trying to equip educators and parents with the tools for being guides to this new environment rather than time cops, or no screens allowed type people because that's what's missing. Like I see these eight-year-olds going on their first Minecraft servers and there is nobody, nobody guiding them through that activity, whether that's unless they happen to have an older sibling. So that there's a vacuum of adult leadership in this space and that's the part that I am personally feeling very concerned about. As a methodology, just for this most recent book in particular, we really did focus on the positive examples. Like, you're completely right that it's like a very selective sample. And we uh, were inspired by the uh, positive deviance methodology from public health, where they go into communities uh, that may be distressed, but they try to find families who are thriving within those communities and elevate those practices. Who is doing an amazing job given the same set of constraints and resources, rather than saying, okay, we're outsiders, we think you're gonna do better, or we're gonna send you energy bars, or whatever it is. It's like, what, can, who, what are kids doing that's already amazing? And they're exceptional, but they're things that everybody should be able to do. And the cases were specifically selected to be, in a way, non-representative, but instructive for things we might want to do. Uh, so I'm uh, doing my MA with uh, in CSAL, and I usually work with L2 creators and writers. Um, I work with younger kids, and I also work with close to accomplished and valuable students. Uh, but irrespective of that fact, I do I think the life skills is a topic which is quite missing a piece of it for L1 and L2 creators and writers or students in general. I just wanted to know, what, uh, has it been your uh, inclination or the vision of the 
developing teams of integrating those values for our those our critical those teams in a wider project learning processes. Uh, for example, how to register for gas connections, how to uh, uh, apply for social security. Because yeah. these are the, uh, because even though I teach academic stuff in my university space or when I'm working with certain readers, I think these life skills play a much more important role uh, outside their personal academic struggles that they usually go uh, come across. So has it been the vision of your uh learning labs to implicate those learning objectives with language objectives? Well, IB is a perfect example of connected learning, right? Because you're building on a shared purpose principle. And I think it's also a great example of like reminding us that we shouldn't think of interests really narrowly. Like it doesn't have to be just like popular music or something like that, but interests in the sense of, you know, you have a stake or an interest in something. And I think those kinds of those examples you shared that, you know, I would love to learn more about what you're doing. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, so I come from another science education background um, in the classroom teaching. So I think about like connecting these spaces. So is is there a way to do that that we can kind of balance maybe the seriousness of the content? Like in a way, it's incorporating students' interests and their hobbies while it gets them engaged and teaches them skills that they need. When we're talking about domain knowledge, is it something that can compromise the seriousness of that? Or is the reality that they're more blended? Um, are we thinking that maybe we need to break down this conception that our content knowledge needs to be serious and in a, delivered in a certain way? Um, and then trying to work out of that, is there, is there a space like Wattpad that, that, that should remain sacred and outside of the school? Um, so I, I just, I study games and in learning. Um, and I always think about that. Like how, how much of incorporating their home life um, how does that balance with our content? Yeah. No, you're asking the really hard questions, you know, because <laughs> it's like, I remember when, even on the blogging example, when, you know, blogs were first taking off, we had an initiative around social media in the classroom, and when we first brought the idea of blogging um, for class to the students, they were like, what? That would be like blogging with my mom. That would suck. <laughs> and <laughs> so that art of, you know, especially if you're dealing with a formal and, or high stakes environment, you can't simply just like adopt the idioms the, the, of fun, like because kids know that it's about like getting a great, like you can't just, it's the chocolate covered broccoli problem. Like you can't just, uh, you, it has to be authentic, right? So I think you're, those are exactly the kinds of hard questions that you have to navigate because there is, um, it needs to be authentic, right? And so if you're not in an environment where, like even the case of the um, writing teacher I showed you, he decided not to grade his students in that class. So you have to walk the walk too. And so if you're in an environment where you don't have the freedom to, you know, just let, the kids do what they're interested in or whatever, then it's not an authentic environment to do that kind of work. So then, you know, you, you think of the connected part as being something, something else. Like it doesn't have to be the core of the curriculum. And in fact, that's often the hardest place. So a lot of times it will be that same teacher sponsoring a gaming club after school or opening up their classroom for lunch or you know, and even though that, again, that may seem trivial to you as an instructor who are teaching things really hard, we have talked to so many kids who are like, it was that teacher who did that for us. Let us play StarCraft after school. That really changed my trajectory. So, um, but it's not about changing everything you do to be all fun and games, too, so. Friends, can you join me in thanking Dr. Ito for her time?